So I'm Billy. I am a developer relations engineer at Google, and my focus is on cloud big table. So I've created a bunch of art with uh, our monitoring tool, Key Visualizer, that looks something like this. And in this talk, I'm going to walk you through some big table basics, but if you're not a big table expert or uh, it doesn't seem right for you, I'm not going to get too deep into it. Uh, my main focus is going to talk about. And you will explain why that could actually be useful. Um, my main uh, focus will be talking about generating data with Beam and generating queries. Um, and then we'll mix it all together and do some big table and beam and create all this work, all these works of art with Key Visualizer. So what is big table? It is a massively scalable, high throughput, globally distributed NoSQL database service on Google Cloud Platform. And I know that's a mouthful. So I like to think about it like this, kind of a standard table. There are rows, columns, and we, in each cell, there are values. Um, and these are, um, you can store different, uh, just kind of store anything in them. Um, but values, are, uh, each cell, you can have different values at different timestamps. So that's kind of what this thing popping out here for. Um, for this talk, we actually don't even need to get too deep into any of that. Um, Bigtable's main feature is scalability. So you kind of start with three nodes and get around 30,000 QPS. Then uh, and around like seven and a half terabytes for storage on SSD. But if you need more, you're scaling your application up, your business is growing, you can add more nodes, and those numbers are going to scale linearly um, pretty much uh, to basically any of your application's needs. So this is great for obviously if your application's growing, but you can also do it on the fly. So if you're going to run your Beam pipeline, over some of this data, scale your big table nodes up a little bit, which is a pretty quick operation. And then once your job is done, you can scale back down. And to scale, to manage the number of nodes you have, you can do that through our user interface or um, create any auto scaling scripts that you want. So once you've written some of your data, the queries you can do on big table are a get based on the row key or a scan on a range of row keys. And we also have some server-side filtering to go along with those. Um, but the row key is the primary way you're going to interact with Bigtable. And it'll look a little something like this. It's kind of a concatenation of a bunch of strings or a bunch of values. So here, this is data for like a mobile time series database. We have a device type, um, which is a phone or a tablet, a device ID which is just a hash, and then we have a year, month, day, date. So we these are kind of the things we can do really easy queries on. Um, and to get the maximum performance out of Bigtable, you want to distribute your queries across a wide set of row keys. And to know that you're doing that correctly, you'll use the key visualizer. It's basically a heat map of the QPS over your key space. So on the left side, you have the row keys, and then in the middle, you've got the heat map of QPS. And you can see there are some patterns there that you can look for to see if those areas are getting hit a lot. Or um, there are some like really bright white lines, which means those row keys are getting hit a ton and um, might not be as performant. So that's it for Big Table Basics. Let's talk about generating data with Beam, because I feel like that's what's interesting for, for you all. And generating data is great if you're using like sample data, if you need sample data for an application that you're trying out and need it to be bigger scale than just what you can come up with on your own, or if you want to do any load testing on your database. So of course, we're using Beam. And I'm in the Google, Google Cloud Platform ecosystem, so I'm going to use Dataflow for this. And I might use Beam and Dataflow a little interchangeably here. So um, sorry about that. So it kind of in this ecosystem, we've got a ton of data sources and syncs. So a lot of this can apply to, a lot of what I'm going to show can apply to other kinds of databases and within the GCP ecosystem, but also kind of just anything that has a cloud uh, or a, an Apache Beam connector. So let's look at some code. And all of this is available on GitHub. And I have a tutorial on how to make this art. So um, you can check that out uh, afterwards. And I'll provide links. 
So writing to big table, this is writing and reading are both pretty standard. So I'll speed through them for because I'm sure you're kind of more um, uh, more adept at Beam than most people if you're at, at this conference. Um, so you create a configuration. Here I'm just passing two strings to start my pipeline. Um, then I have kind of an inline do function where I just take those strings, use them as a row key to create a mutation, and then I pass that to write to big table. So this is kind of the most basic if I want to just write some data to big table, but it's a little annoying if I have to do um, like create the array of all the strings or do something like that. So what I found to be most useful was to use generate sequence. And I would kind of use this to send pulses. So here I do from zero to a thousand. And basically that'll just send a thousand pulses to start this pipeline and generate um, data. And I can use that row key or I can use that input to maybe generate a row key or do some some other kind of data generation in there. I also found that I uh, was maybe generating data a little too quickly. Um, so I added this rate limiting. So with a rate uh, one and every second, I was going to send a pulse. And I kind of played with this to make sure it worked correctly. So reading from big table, again, you have a configuration. And then you can just kind of do your standard read from with the Cloud Big Table IO connector. Here, I'm passing also a scan. So I'm not going to scan the whole table. I can do maybe a prefix. So I want to get maybe all the data for phones or all the data for a phone with a specific ID. I can just use that as my scan. Then from there, you could read from big table, reduce by ID, and then do any kind of ETL that you want. Um, so here, maybe you could count by ID or something like that. But what I was kind of curious about was, could I generate a sequence and then interact with big table? Could I query it in a way? Um, and this didn't seem like I could do that with kind of those, those basic things. So what I found was the abstract cloud big table do function, uh, which ex just extends the do function. And this is just a, just a brief snippet from there, uh, from the, from this code. But it is. It's kind of pretty simple what it's doing. Basically, it creates a synchronized connection that you can use. So um, uh, if the connection exists, it'll uh, just return that. But if it doesn't, it will create a new connection. And this is all synchronized. So you're gonna, it's going to play really well with um, Beam pipelines. So instead of having to kind of recreate that connection, which can be kind of costly, especially if I wanted to do maybe 20,000 queries, um, this will kind of create one per worker and make it work in a distributed environment. So here's what I do to get big table in between. I start by generating my sequence similar to writing the data. Then I apply my uh, do function, which is a read from table function, which extends that abstract cloud big table do function. That's certainly a mouthful. And then in my process element, I can just call get connection. And that's going to kind of take care of all those um, distributed elements for me. I can just get the table and interact with it um, there. And now I can do generate my sequence and query the database. So now I know how to generate the, those, um, generate queries on a database and also just generate a bunch of data into a database. So let's start with that. Just generate writing data. I got to write the data before I can read it. So here's kind of my sample data set I figured and generate from like zero to 10,000. And in my data, I think I just used one column and wrote five megabytes of random data to it. And I didn't use the input as the row key. I switched it around so it would be um, um, kind of a reversed number. And then I padded it so it would be like five digits here. So four becomes 40,000. And this distributes the row keys while you're writing them. Because writing to big table and reading to big table, you want to be distributing those row keys. Uh, so this is just kind of a little trick to do that um, or to make it a little bit more performant. And again, this isn't really like a real type of row key. You're going to more see row keys that look like this, which are concatenations of values. But we're just doing this for just to get a bunch of data in. So I load in the data. I just uh, run the Java code. And again, that's all available. Um, I, am monitor I can monitor it with data flow. So this is kind of one of the great things about having a um, managed runner. I it just kind of scales up the workers for me. Um, and 
Um, you get you can monitor the throughput and all that stuff to make sure everything is working smoothly. Then I can also monitor it on the big table end. I have a my <laughs> graphs are shooting up really high. I was actually getting a little bit beyond the CPU utilization. So I think I added a few nodes while this was happening. Um, and then I can go to the key visualizer and see what it looks like. So it's a huge bright um, bright light at the start because there was just a ton of data that's being written. Um, but it's all distributed, which is good because that's really the core goal is distribute the data and get maximize the database. Um, and then it kind of peters out a little bit, but it's still distributed throughout. So I thought, can I query certain areas of row keys at certain times and get art to show up? So I started simple. I said, if maybe if I could scan all the row keys that start with one and all the row keys that start with like three or something for 15 minutes, which is kind of how long the um, intervals are, can I do that and get um, something to show up? And then I go to the next 15, I do a different set. And the next set, I do a different set, kind of making pixel art. So I wrote up a CSV by hand. I was like all zeros and then pick the ones to make a smiley face. I did a little bit of math and you can check that out on um, uh, on GitHub. It's not super, it's not really that beam related. So I didn't want to get too into it. Uh, but basically I divided up the range of row keys. I think there are 10 rows here. So I split them up into 10 and said, if it's a one, add that range to the scan that I'm going to do. And I don't do anything with the scan, but just by scanning it, it will activate um, them in the key visualizer. So I was able to get a smiley face. And I thought, OK, I can at least get something to appear here. But with art or with any kind of image, there's a little bit more depth. So I thought, maybe can I do a gradient? So I made a new CSV, just one line, or just one column, I guess, and uh, did the zero through one and basically was going to use these as percentages for how frequently I would scan. And because I was maybe doing thousands of scans per 15 minute interval, I thought maybe it'll average out to something like this. And uh, I was able to get a gradient. So now I thought, okay, I have all the tools to, on how to do this. So I wrote up a code pen in JavaScript that would take an image and convert it into one of those CSV files. And you can click on that if you want to, but it'll basically look something like this. Um, upload an image, specify how many hours you wanted to draw because of the because of the 15 minute intervals. It's kind of that depends on how much you're going to draw. And then I made my final pipeline. So every second, so I was using generate sequence from zero to I guess I think I just set it to I didn't even set a from. And then it's going to do all this stuff. So it's going to download the image CSV, which I stored in Google Cloud Storage, and then divide the row keys evenly based on that. And I applied a similar concept here that the abstract big table do function was doing. I basically said, do all of this once per worker, kind of store it, and then we don't have to keep downloading it every time. Then I create a scan based on the range of row keys, and I read from big table. And my final works of art were here. So I did American Gothic. I did. Um, I think it's Sunday in the Park. I'm forgetting the names of some of these paintings. I'm not an I am not an art history buff. Um, I did the persistence of memory. What's one thing that was cool about the key visualizer is you can change the brightness or the intensity. So if you've got a certain area that's really hot, you can um, tone that down to see is it a specific row or zoom in and zoom out. Um, so I thought that was a cool addition to get for the art. And you can also see different metrics. So here I'm looking at read bytes per client as well as ops. So um, uh, uh, read bytes was seemed like a little bit smoother, but ops had like the lines throughout it. So I thought, I thought that was a cool way to get a little bit more texture into the pieces. So if you want to read more, I've got a blog post on all of this. I've got a code lab that walks you through how to generate this. There are some big table docs, some key visualizer docs. Um, and those have a little bit more of the math or a little bit more um, information. Uh, and some of them are a little bit more um, Beam and Dataflow beginner friendly. So if you want to check those out, um, I can provide links afterwards. But thank you all for um, attending my talk.
Awesome. That was a really cool talk, Billy. Um, I never thought I'd see Salvador Dali pop up on the Google Cloud platform. So thanks for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, I know you, right before we, we started, you were saying you tried maybe doing some data flow on big table and ran into like some scaling issues because you were getting a little bit too much data on there. And so I had that same problem. Um, and that was kind of interesting to play with. Um, this was kind of my first depth, like really in-depth dive into using Beam. And it was interesting because I'd never had this much data in Bigtable before because I didn't know how else I was going to generate it. So I feel like I learned a ton of different skills here. Um, <clears throat> I was able to learn a bit more of the Bigtable monitoring tools, but also like how to get creative with Beam. Um, and we also have um, uh, Firestore, another uh, database on GCP. Is that I think it was announced that coming soon they're going to have a key visualizer. So I can't wait to try it out. Um, try making more art on there. <laughs> That's um, nice. That's give nice. Me, give me more opportunities to make fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice to see you're enjoying yourself um, on, on the Google Cloud platform. Um, any chance you want to share something about your journey with Apache Beam? Things you, you really enjoyed, things you think maybe we could improve? or hmm. um, I think one of my biggest confusion points of it was because I tried doing it without reading the documentation. And then I took some time to read the documentation and it all just, it's really good documentation. Um, so that's, that was definitely helpful. But I, um, yeah, I think the, I think spending some time to read documentation is a, uh, always a, a virtue. Um, but it's, it, yeah, I mean, it's really clear on how to use it. Um, okay. Cool. No, that's, that's good to know. I think, uh, we had a lot of efforts going doing, the, um, while well, making better documentation. So I'm happy to hear it, it paid off. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing that always comes up since really Beam supported in like Go, Java, Python is like, how do you create consistent documentation for all these languages? And like, not all of the connectors are gonna be supported and all of them. So um, I've only really gone through the Java stuff. I, I was actually starting to go through Python um, and go through that, but I've, I was like, I have to read through everything again so I can understand it all. I'm also not a Python. I'm not as big into Python. So I was like, I need an example so I can figure out what's happening. Yeah, I can understand that. Actually, if um, talking about languages, I think tomorrow morning we have the, the Go SDK update. So if you're interested to, to do it in, um, in Go, that might be a good talk to watch. Oh, cool. <laughs> Awesome. Um, there's no questions from the audience yet, but um, I, I think you mentioned um, you might want to uh, share some of the resources you, you just showed on to the Slack channel. So I think we could maybe take the conversation there if that's, uh, if that's fine with you. Sure. Yeah, I'll share the links there. I'm also available on Twitter if you have questions, at Billy Jacobson. Um, and then also on the uh, blog post I wrote about this, you could ask any questions there. So um, it's pretty easy to it's pretty easy to get in touch with me if you have questions about this. <laughs> awesome, that's uh, that's good to hear, Billy. Thank you very much for joining us, and yeah, hope to have you around. All right, see ya. Bye bye.